going. So friends, uh, formally, uh, thank you for joining this month's Digital Twin Hub Meet, uh, our June, our monthly meet. This one's gonna be a little bit longer than normal. We've got um, a lot to share with you uh, and we will um, certainly have some, uh, some time for questions as well. We have our guest speaker as per usual. Um, but we've got some updates to share uh, with everyone uh, as well, I'd like to um, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging the First Nations people as the original inhabitants of the land of which I'm participating in this meeting today in Brisbane, uh, and recognise the country north and south of the Brisbane River as the home of both the Turbul and Jagera nations. And I pay deep respect to all elders, past, present, and future. Um, a couple of quick housekeeping items. The session is being recorded for those that weren't able to join us today. If you are in a noisy place or subject to background noise, uh, please make sure you exercise uh, your finger on the mute button. Uh, cameras are optional. Uh, we always like to um, uh, sort of see people's faces, um, but we do acknowledge that sometimes there are bandwidth issues, so you are certainly free to turn your camera on. Um, particularly if you're asking questions, uh, that would be um, that would be ideal. And on asking questions, we are certainly encouraging that, as we always do. You can use the chat box at any time throughout this session. We'll be pausing twice for sort of some more intense uh, Q and A, um, uh, but also uh, also uh, asking verbally questions when we get to those uh, those points is uh, certainly encouraged as well. But if you wanted to ask along the way, the chat box is, uh, is there for your use. So um, hopefully I don't need to really uh, advertise the fact that there is a uh, digital twin hub. Um, that is what the purpose of this meeting is every month to sort of rally around the hub. Uh, we can't do it particularly well in person at the moment. So it is virtual coming together. Uh, and of course the hub, as in the website is where we sort of post and talk and share uh, and um, engage. Um, but for those that may, uh, may be new to uh, the work that we're doing at the Smart Cities Council around all things Digital Twin, um, there is a Digital Twin Hub. So if you head to digitaltwinhub.org, you'll get a sense of what we're doing and what's happening. Uh, I'd also like to, while I uh, am talking about the hub, I'd like to uh, welcome a couple of uh, new members to our task force uh, and Smart Cities Council uh, new members that have been onboarded. And I'd like particularly uh, to give a shout out to Becca Bentley and also Spatial Vision who have recently joined us. Um, I'm going to touch on about three topics before then handing over to, sorry, before we have some Q&A uh, and then before that, uh, before we then hand over to uh, Andrew, our guest presenter. Um, so I'm gonna to touch on the Digital Twin Blueprint for Australia and New Zealand, uh, New Zealand Digital Twin Summit, Digital Twin Week 2021 and the Digital Twin Challenge. I will do those somewhat briefly. Um, I'll pause after that and uh, certainly invite questions, um, but would love, uh, would love any um, questions to come through on the chat at any time. Um, I, I imagine about half of you, when I scan our um, uh, attendee list today, probably about half of you, I think, are aware of uh, what has been uh, the digital twin strategy for Australia and New Zealand, uh, just over a year in the making now. Um, many of you have been part of that process. Many of you have requested the link to the Google Doc that's been open uh, and um, not necessarily editable, but certainly inviting questions and comments and additions. Um, we've been wading through all of that. And what you see on the screen right now is the latest version of what we're now calling the Australia New Zealand Digital Twin Blueprint. Um, we've had a change of name from strategy to blueprint um, for a range of reasons. The most, uh, the most sort of notable being that um, a strategy kind of never, uh, a strategy never ends in terms of a point. Uh, and we had a document that was about 68, 69 pages long. 
with lots and lots of content uh, and it was just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So we thought a nice succinct version of that in the form of a blueprint um, was our preferred approach. We took that to the task force last month, uh, got the thumbs up and we are almost finished bringing the, the big beast down to around about 17, 18 pages. Um, so our intent is that we will uh, launch the Australian New Zealand Digital Twin Blueprint uh, in Wellington in person on Thursday, July the 8th at the New Zealand Digital Twin Summit. Uh, and that will be launched as a draft blueprint uh, and very much looking forward to getting industry feedback um, over the coming months after that. Um, this has always been a process of co-creation and stewarding uh, to a point where hopefully and potentially um, other core stakeholders can certainly come and pick up parts of it uh, and take it forward. But um, it's been a, a very uh, long labour of love, but I think uh, for those particularly that have been part of the process and some of our task force members, it has, uh, has been somewhat uh, rewarding and also a learning process. Uh, so that's the blueprint, which was the first uh, which was the first item I wanted to mention. Um, within the blueprint, there is a really important part of that document, which defines what a digital twin is. Um, and when I refer to a definition of a digital twin, um, there's a part where we talk about a digital twin being a set of capabilities. Um, and so this is a really important slide for a number of reasons. One, we are carrying through the idea of digital twin being a set of capabilities. We're taking that idea uh, and embedding that throughout all of our other uh, digital twin work. Um, but also given that it's in the blueprint, we really wanna make sure that we start uh, advocating for this uh, approach to defining the digital twin because we are finding that, is, that it is becoming uh, extremely inclusive uh, and equitable um, when we define it in a way like this, um, it starts becoming tangible uh, and key stakeholders, for example, like local government, start to resonate with sort of those capabilities. Um, of course, we, we know and acknowledge the definition of the digital twin being a digital replica of a physical thing, um, but that's not very inclusive language uh, to bring in really important stakeholders that can benefit from digital twin capabilities. So I wanted to highlight that you will see this uh, certainly front and center in the blueprint. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's been um, carried through uh, a lot of our uh, more recent work as well, um, such as a session that we will have during the day uh, on 8th of July in Wellington. Um, we have a couple of uh, friends on the line, I believe that are from uh, New Zealand. Um, so we'll be hosting the New Zealand Digital Twin Summit uh, on Thursday, the 8th of July, a day long summit. Um, information is on, uh, on the Digital Twin Hub for those that are interested. Um, unfortunately for our Aussie friends on the line, it is an in-person only event, um, but a perfect opportunity to take a quick trip to New Zealand, which is a absolutely adorable country and one that I have a very big policy crush on at the moment, as you would have seen in our latest article on the hub around the, um, uh, the, the, the sort of prospect of a, of a nationwide digital twin in New Zealand. So loving, loving the sort of political leadership um, around digital twin in New Zealand at the moment. Um, but for those that can't make that summit in person, our, uh, our hub meet, um, next month we'll feature a debrief. So we'll have a range of the panelists uh, and speakers that were involved in that joining us on the hub meet and we'll have a bit of a, a debrief um, given that uh, we, do, we do have a, a predominantly Australian audience um, in, our, in our hub meets. So um, Digital Twin Hub, uh, Digital Twin Summit, Wellington, 8th of July. If you can get to New Zealand, um, please join us. Um, in the, uh, in, in, in the same neighborhood in terms of events, um, letting you all know that Digital Twin Week 2021 um, is well and truly um, shaping up. 
Um, here are some of the highlights so far and what to expect. Um, we have 23 sessions across five days penciled in. Um, we've been going through a process for those that know, maybe some of you don't, since October last year, we've had expressions of interest out um, for uh, curation of sessions. Um, we had a whole range of EOIs come in and um, we are just as we speak, finalizing and sending out uh, invitations to those that expressed an interest to come into the program and host a session. Um, so of the 23 sessions, we have about four, maybe five that are left. Um, and it's a fantastic, um, it's a fantastic sort of lineup of, of organizations, both public and private sector and academia that will be um, hosting a session during that time. Digital Twin Week will be fully virtual. Um, 23 sessions. Uh, we're going to have two networking lounges this year, more social, more networking, uh, based on feedback from last year. Uh, a couple of familiar faces in there, an opening plenary, um, a case study series on the best digital twin work across the region. That'll be the feature on Wednesday the 20th. Uh, a UK uh, sundowner uh, with Centre for Digital Built Britain. Um, we have a feature session on early evening, late afternoon, Tuesday the 19th with the European Commission. They're bringing in a range of cities uh, in their network. We've got a breakfast session with Orange County in Florida in the US. Um, we're gonna have a feature on the digital twin challenge project teams and also a local government round table just to mention a few of the sessions. So. Um, we'll be getting the program up in the next couple of weeks and the ability to sort of register and lock that in. So very much looking forward to that. Um, let me now turn to what I think is um, my last item before we break for some questions, which is the Digital Twin Challenge. Um, this is the first sort of public update on the Digital Twin Challenge. They will be coming more frequently and uh, more in depth uh, over the next 18 months as that program um, rolls out. For those that have no idea what the Digital Twin Challenge is, you can head to the, the hub, uh, all the relevant information is there. But in short, we have a cohort of around about 18 organizations who have come together and will be collectively advancing 13 projects over the next 18 months. The 13 projects are up on the screen there. Um, there's a mix of horizontal related issues that we're tackling. There's a range of uh, somewhat vertical issues in some areas like landscape based digital twins, for example, um, some sort of deep dive areas like um, data visualization and, and AI for digital twins. So we've got a good mix of projects in there. Those projects were scoped based on sort of the last two years of doing digital twin advocacy and engagement across the region. Um, and so those uh, 18 organizations have all identified which projects they would like to be part of. Um, some of them are gonna be part of multiple projects. Um, and over the next 18 months, we, uh, the collective we within the cohort of those 18 organizations will essentially build out um, uh, artifacts, if I can use that terminology, um, that represent these 13 projects. Uh, and at Digital Twin Week 2022, next October, we will essentially launch and release and donate all of the knowledge resources that have been created uh, back to industry and government and the entire purpose of the Digital Twin Challenge is to play our role in helping catalyze the marketplace uh, and help build capability. Uh, and so again, going back to that um, Digital Twin definition by capability slide, uh, that will be a core part in helping structure and guide these 13 projects. You can see there's 13 projects in there that are very diverse, um, relevant to many different sectors. Um, not all projects will be advanced to the extent that some others will. We have eight of those projects on the screen that are of highest sort of priority and interest. 
to the cohort, um, around about another four behind that that are very, um, very much high priority. But then uh, we also have a couple of others that uh, are less priority, but equally important that we want to advance in some way. Um, so you will hear more about the Digital Twin Challenge. You'll be treated to sort of, I suppose, uh, early reveals of some of the knowledge resources that get created. Um, we'll be using Digital Twin Week, of course, as a key platform to share what's coming out of the challenge. There will also be public webinars and updates, uh, and indeed, um, you'll be invited to deep dives uh, from time to time to help, uh, should you wish to, um, be part of um, scoping up those, uh, those potential projects. Um, we'll also have um, uh, some progress reports, formal progress reports too, uh, throughout the 18 month period. Um, and for the cohort members, they'll be participating in monthly meetings, their own deep dives, uh, a, lot of, um, uh, a lot of networking and relationship building. We'll be having two international exchanges, one with Europe, one with the US, uh, and there'll be uh, quite a significant three-day in-person gathering of the entire cohort and those 18 organisations. Um, for those of you that may be interested in exploring more about the challenge, um, we are fielding um, queries and questions and interest, uh, even though applications have closed, um, but we are going to continually um, look at opportunities to add value to the challenge. And so we will keep an open mind and would be certainly willing to uh, have a conversation with anyone that may be interested in any of those 13 projects that you see up on the screen. So you can get in touch with us uh, through the hub at any time. Um, so I believe that was, uh, yes, that was my, um, my, last, uh, my last slide uh, before I pause, which I will do now. I invite any questions through the chat box and I invite any questions verbally if you wanted to uh, turn your camera on, introduce yourself and um, ask away. So I will pause there for a moment. Any questions at all that I've gone through? Digital Twin Week, New Zealand Digital Twin Summit, the Digital Twin Blueprint, Digital Twin Challenge, any questions or reactions or thoughts at all? Okay. Oh. Adam, hi. Hi, Julian. Just thought I'd um, save you from the awkward silence. Yeah, Actually, thank you so much. I owe you. Yes. <laughs> um, you might have answered this already, but Digital Twin Week, mm -hmm. uh, have you figured out how are we going to do that as remotely? Are we going to do it as a mixed, remote, virtual, in person? Um, in, anything along those lines have been sorted out? Um, it's fundamentally being designed online, okay, because A, we have a big international audience as well, and our reach just allows us to be broader than what, what, what it would normally be. However, in saying that, um, we will in the next couple of weeks be going back to all of the session curators that we've been uh, working with, and we will start to go a little bit deeper. Uh, and it might be that those sessions um, are in some way or have in some way a, uh, an in-person presence, but the, the necessity is that it needs to be streamed as well. So we will we'll go through, we might find that some of those sessions, um, there's the technology capability and willingness to have uh, a small in-person gathering, but it'd be, um, it'd be streamed as well. So. Um, Short answer, the short response, Julian, still online, uh, predominantly 2021, because of um, all, all COVID related things. We have aspirations that Digital Twin Week 2022 might be an in-person gathering. Uh, of course, not for an entire week, but we would jam a week's worth of uh, goodness into a couple of days. So that's the current thinking. 
I'm sure we'll have holograms of ourselves by then I'm, anyway. I'm, so I'm, I'm sure okay. we will. I'm sure we will. I'm sure we will. But thank you for the question. Uh, any other questions or comments uh, before we move on? Yeah, Chris. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, Chris. Yeah. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Um, what's your, how far have you got in terms of the engagements into local government um, on these programs that uh, you've been outlining? Thank you. Yeah, great question, Chris. Um, let me talk to some of the programs and the intersection with local government, um, which is, of course, a key audience for us. Um, combined local government in Australia, in Australia sit on $340 billion worth of assets. So it's certainly an important stakeholder for us. Um, of the 18-ish uh, uh, organisations uh, who are participating in the Digital Twin Challenge, we have five local authorities uh, scattered across both Australia and New Zealand. Uh, we have some of the largest metro councils. We have regional councils. We have coastal towns. Uh, and we have uh, rural LGAs as well, rural councils as well. So the challenge is going to be a great opportunity for us to stress test the opportunities of digital twin capability with local government. Um, and we're excited with the cohort that we have. Um, we already have another three LGAs that are expressing interest in the challenge. So um, through the Digital Twin Challenge, we believe it'll be a great opportunity to engage local government. Um, we also have been running a couple of, a couple of sort of on the side uh, round tables with local government um, to test uh, to sort of test the intersecting points, uh, getting feedback from local government around what they think about digital twin. And that goes to that, um, you know, that, that sort of narrative and definitional sort of lens around capability that I referred to earlier. Um, we have local government who have very deep uh, talent expertise infrastructure in GIS, Many are going deep into visualization. Uh, so they are on a digital twin journey already. Uh, and so we, we certainly see that there's, there's big opportunity there. So a lot of, lot of intersecting points, Chris, with local government. We only hope that that will continue. Um, thank you for that, that question. Okay, one final last call for questions, comments, or thoughts before we move on. Adam, yes, yes, I like that. Uh, yeah, Ilsa, Ilsa, Ilsa. Ilsa. <laughs> that's all right. Um, just in regards to the cha uh, challenge, um, I appreciate that there's probably lots of overlap in terms of the, the kind of programs that you've got listed there. Is there any um, uh, thoughts around how these are intended to sit together? Um, to be able to provide that big picture and whether they, some of the outcomes do you envisage will give guidance to, you know, whatever institution or government about the things they could be doing to complement these, these programs? Yeah, that's a great uh, question, Isla. And um, we have, uh, so, let, let me just share, for starters, we're in a mobilization phase. We have the, we have, we have the cohort assembled. Uh, we went through a, a quite ex, an extensive due diligence process. We then invited those applicants into the challenge. Uh, we had a number of applicants that weren't invited in. Um, we've been doing due diligence. We've been doing scoping. We actually have in about an hour and a half's time, our first small cluster group. So as an example, there's five of these projects already that have very strong connections with other, other, other projects. So um, we have 13 now. We may not end up with 13 by October next year. We may have halved. We may have brought more in. Um, we're going through each of those individually and sort of mapping these out, further describing them, looking at who the potential partners might be, what the outputs might be. Um, the team leads, uh, we're looking at the engagement we'll do with industry and government along the way. Um, so as we go through that process to unpack each and every one of those 13 and develop a deeper scope, we may find that the overlap is just too strong that we just bring it together. 
Um, so it, it's it's an iterative and organic process. Um, and that's that's why we want to share along the way how the challenge progresses, because we know that um, certainly others outside of the cohort will have really good ideas and we want to encourage uh, any sharing that people are willing to sort of engage with. So um, we'll continue to share uh, Isla the, um, uh, the the sort of status on how these um, how these go about. We'll be doing uh, digital twin hub meet in August. Will be a deep dive on where the projects are at. So we'll be sharing a little bit more deeper. And then again at Digital Twin Week in October, uh, and you know, at other times. So certainly, um, certainly, you know, stay tuned for more to come. Um, a great question. Final one here, and then we will, we'll move on uh, for our final half hour with uh, with Andrew. So Anand has said, "Are you in a position to share any major industry representatives' names participating in the Digital Twin?" Summit. Um, yes, we've got some great, uh, great industry representatives that are in there. I'm looking at my whiteboard in front of me where it's all mapped out. KPMG, Oricon, Bentley, Frontier SI, Service New South Wales, Becker, Veris, PCSG, uh, and others. So we have additional invitations going out to those that have expressed an interest, um, combined with our, our government related uh mornings and also sundowners uh and then the digital twin in action feature session on the wednesday anand uh which is a two-hour session uh a series of case studies we will actually call for eois on those case studies separately so um a great week we hope coming up and so, uh, with that, let me uh, let me move straight on here to uh, welcoming our uh, our guest Andrew Kerthwas, who's been very patiently uh, listening in and 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 waiting. Andrew, thanks so much for joining us. A lot of local people, hopefully here in uh, in Brisbane, but also throughout Australia, uh, would know Andrew uh, and the significant policy related work that uh, he advanced with the Queensland state government. Uh, over a number of years and, and now uh, among many other roles, not just the two that are on the screen in front of you, um, is, uh, is with the uh, Cross River Rail project uh, as digital relationship um, manager and also um, in his capacity and what he's going to talk about today as chair of the Australian BIM Advisory Board. So with that, Andrew, I'm going to hand straight over to you i'll stop sharing here and would love for you to um share with our guests all things abab and digital twin thanks so much thanks adam uh, i really appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be here today and uh, it's great to see so many familiar um names and faces um just as as people that coming on to the to join the hub I too would like to respectfully acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the lands on which we meet, elders past, present um, and emerging. Now, all good organisations um, have um, importance around um, setting up um, a vision, setting up actions um, and all those sorts of things to articulate what we're about. I just want to run through a couple of things here, but what we're going to do today is just going to talk about what ABAB is, what it does, some strategic directions that it's taken, um, and also uh, just present our, our paper on the Digital Twins, which is a position paper which we worked on through 2020 and we released uh, earlier in the year. So for those of you who may not know, the Australasian BIM Advisory Board is made up of leaders from government, industry and academia. Um, who are partnering to provide leadership on the adoption of BIM and project um, team in integration, fundamentally. We can see the value that uh, BIM and digital provides, but we can see the enormous opportunities that uh, digital elements will create to improve asset outcomes over the life um, of the asset that is developed. Now, BIM adoption, as we all know, and digital engineering adoption is on the rise, and the board believes that it will be business as usual in the foreseeable future. 
And we're looking forward to the release of the Australian Infrastructure Plan by Infrastructure Australia later this year, uh, in July, I understand, which is going to call out some really good um, actions um, on digital. Last year, um, Australia collectively spent around 250 billion or invested 250 billion on construction. And this has been increasing as governments have invested in new infrastructure initiatives, particularly in response to COVID. Um, but there are great opportunities to use that digital information that's getting generated to improve asset outcomes and also to improve the skills of everybody involved in the construction sector. So we believe that at ABAP, by working together, government, industry and academia can maximise the value of BIM to deliver improved efficiencies and increased innovation in the, in the management, design, construction and operational phases um, of the built asset. But importantly, leadership and coordination is key. The board wants to ensure that industry has confidence to invest and if, and if it can deliver certainty across all the jurisdictions in Australia, that will then encourage investment or you know, fast track investment into digital. Now we need recognise that there needs to be a consistent approach you know, articulated by governments, but also supported by peak industries, by universities, and then picked up by the industry sector, because that will create an environment of certainty for investment decisions. As I mentioned, all good organisations have uh, strategic directions and when we're not similar to that. One of the things we want to do is look at coordination and collaboration because without coordination and collaboration, there's a significant risk of waste and duplicated effort, fragmented, fragmented development of protocols and guidelines and inconsistent approaches to the adoption of BIM, all which leads to greater inefficiency across Australasia. Now, we know that um, when you look at the Australasian market, Australia and New Zealand, you know, we are a smaller market than the Californian market. You know, if we can get the digital uptake to drive efficiencies, to get better coordination, to get better support from industry, that can only lead to better outcomes through the entire life cycle of the asset. We've also got a, an education and awareness program uh, where we are looking to work with academia to get better outcomes and to embed digital in a coordinated way um, through the university sector. So good advice provided at the right time can positively shape the future direction of BIM in Australia and indeed um, in New Zealand, as well as complement the broader digital environment in Australasia and more globally. One of the things we prepared uh, in 2019 was the Australian BIM Strategic Framework, which was endorsed by the, uh, the Board of Treasurers, which is all uh, state and territory treasurers in Australia. They supported this. They can see the value that's being developed. Um, and they are looking at uh, developing and adopting standards to ensure open and common data environments as well as providing clear direction about how government will get involved in that leadership role. It will then enhance procurement um, and contractual arrangements and encourage the ongoing development of skills um, and build capabilities, which is so key in this sector. Uh, so the Board of Treasurers signed off on the Australian BIM Strategic Framework back in August 2019. The Victorian government is leading that conversation so that all jurisdictions will have an opportunity to participate. Obviously, last year there was an interruption to um, the ongoing policy development because of all the responses around COVID. But we're hoping that um, as uh, we work into this new normal environment, that the, the development and the opportunities that were created through the Board of Treasurers won't be lost um, and we'll be able to continue that uh, policy piece with the Board of Treasurers. So essentially what, what ABAB is trying to do is coordinate that big change piece. Um, it's a creature of um, the Australasian Procurement and Construction Council, the Australian uh, Construction Industry Forum, Matt Speck, uh, Building Smart and Standards Australia. So it has quite a wide, wide group of parents. Um, we've been operating since 2017, May 2017, and we've set a clear focus. Um, and what we're trying to do is, is you know, coordinate that program of change, look at the um, digital opportunities, what are the emerging um, uh, challenges that we're going to face collectively, 
how can we capitalise on things like digital twin to the benefit of all participants in the construction sector? So not only to um, governments, not only to the industry, but importantly, to the taxpayers who are wanting better outcomes from their investments that governments oversee over time. So we also want consistency. We want um, you know, new approaches. We want better standards. We want um, this backed by theory, but of course supported by technological gains as well. Um, so what, what ABAP sees its role is acting as an impartial bridge between all those key stakeholders uh, to continue getting better outcomes, which will lead to better solutions uh, and better uptake. So a couple of, just a slide on the, um, the way the governance reporting works. Um, and it's great to have a range of professionals on the board, particularly coming from industry uh, and particularly with some real world experience who can come in and challenge some of the uh, government uh, members um, and just say, look, what you're proposing isn't going to work. Um, but this is, and this, this has been very healthy for um, the board um, and the, the work that we've done. You've probably seen a number of pieces of uh, work that have come out. We prepared uh, bin process consistency and the asset information requirements. And there's been a number of people who are sitting on this um, meetup today, Adam, that have actually contributed to this. So a big shout out to all those people who worked behind the scenes, but have made uh, contributions to the BIM process consistency and asset information requirements. But then last year when, um, you know, we were all uh, encouraged to work a little differently, we decided that we would also develop a position paper that could be considered um, to add to the body of knowledge around position papers that were now, as we all know, a digital twin's the uh, digital representation of a physical asset, a process or a system. Um, and it helps the provider of information to test, to understand and model performance. We know that through sensors and continuous uh, updated surveying information, we can re represent a near, um, a real time near status of the working condition or position of the asset. And this can only benefit outcomes for the community, but also for the asset operator and maintainer. So the digital twin enables us to visualize the asset, check status and perform analysis that we haven't been able to do before. Um, and as the Centre for Digital Britain notes, what distinguishes the digital twin from other digital models is its connection to the physical twin. And that's really where we've got to get to is this tension around what a digital twin actually is and how it relates to the physical twin how you can then test on the digital twin some real world applications that you, you know, forecast might be happening um, on the physical asset. So there's some real benefits that we see and that's why ABAB produced this paper. Um, now we really understand that there is this bi-directional exchange of data between the physical asset and the virtual asset. Um, and that's where we think that, you know, when we look at things like the asset registers, when we look at maintenance logs, when we start to look at, you know, the warranties and the life cycle of some of the individual elements in the assets, we'll get much better information to be able to run the asset harder to, as a friend of mine would say, squeeze the lemon harder to get more out of the asset, but do it with a high level of confidence because we have the digital twin on which to test it first. So really the digital twin, our position paper came from a solid base. It's not something that sits out on its own. It's come from a very solid base of work. And I'd just like to acknowledge uh, Neil Greenstreet who's done and led a lot of this work, um, but it's come from a very solid base. We know that we can increase productivity and improve collaboration. We know that we can uh, reduce construction and operating costs, um, and we can also get better outcomes that all sectors or all participants in the construction sector and the operation sector will enjoy through the life of the asset. But the fundamental thing is it will improve safety on the work sites and improve safety um, in the construction and operation of an asset. So that's gotta be key if we want to make 
better assets and ensure that people have a safe work environment. But not only that, this will start to lead to a better uptake of smart cities and recognising that sensors um, can be attached to all those critical infrastructure and smart city conversations can actually be nested out of digital twins, which will lead to much better outcomes for the future. Um, and there are people today that are uh, only starting to scratch the surface of what a smart city can do, um, but how digital twins are going to be front and centre to that conversation. One of the things that we know is that um, if we had more information, we can make better decisions. Digital twins, particularly around assets, will provide that greater information with the continuous improvement around machine learning and AI, we will get more richer information, we'll get better data. We will then be, provide a high level of confidence around how we're operating those assets, which can only benefit ultimately the taxpayer, but along the way, the operator of the asset, the owner of the asset um, and outcomes for those communities where those new digital assets are. So look, thank you very much, Adam. That's, that's quickly what I wanted to present today. Happy to take some Q&A. Um, and if anyone wants to have a look at our website, I'll just put the website up there to have a look at. I encourage you to, to look at it, um, get in touch with us. If you've got any ideas or suggestions, we always welcome those. And we look forward to uh, uh, engaging with you, Adam, and the team um, into the future. Thanks. Hey, Andrew, thanks so much for that. Uh, on behalf of uh, our, our audience. Um, I'm going to invite uh, anyone to pop a question or comment in the chat box, uh, but also if you wanted to switch your camera on and introduce yourself and ask a question of Andrew, please uh, please certainly uh, do so. Step forward. Uh, would love to uh, would love to hear from you. Um, as people are warming up, Andrew, can I start with um, uh, can I start with what next for ABAB and Digital Twin? Uh, can I throw that one straight onto the table? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Adam. It, it is the, the good, a very good question. One of the things that we're looking at in terms of our full work program is, is um, you know, articulating the value of the Digital Twin back to governments. That's, that's going to be key. Um, and we're looking with interest to what Infrastructure Australia will release later this year in July, as I mentioned, um, and the value that Infrastructure Australia may or might, may not see in digital. You know, in my, as you and I have discussed on many occasions, the, the key to better outcomes for communities will be that digital twin to help make decisions, to help improve outcomes, to give confidence to communities. Um, and I think that that's, that's the work that ABAP's looking at. Remember, it's an advisory board. We all do this in addition to our day jobs. But that's the next uh, element that we're going to look at and how we can support um, that digital twin conversation that are not, are not many, many organisations are having, but how we can support that from a, uh, an Australasian perspective, particularly using governments, using industry and academia to um, distill some of those uh, important positions. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Greg Ryan, welcome. Step on up. Hi, Adam. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Great presentation. Really enjoyed that. And great to, the, the, great to see the amazing work you're doing. Uh, I've got a question in terms of, is your group addressing the, the trust in terms of digital assets and digital twin data? Uh, what we see, say, in the, on the from the water sector is that People do uh, from other sectors do great three and four day modeling or BIM models, and then the data is treated pretty well as junk data because we can't trust it, or there's a lack of trust, and associated with that is the liability and risk of actually trusting that data. So, who bears the liability and accountability? So, there's a few knots in there. I'm wondering if you're tackling any of those. Yeah, great, a great question. Um, we, we acknowledge that that is a challenge for organisations, how organisations warrant that, that data. Um, we haven't gone, we haven't looked at it in detail yet about um, how, you know, a, a warranting or a trust framework that we could establish, but certainly um, one of the elements we, we are looking at. Um, 
you know, as I mentioned, it, it, we we all do we all contribute to this, you know, in addition to our day jobs. So um, it's you know looking at what jurisdictions are doing, looking at what governments around the world are doing in this sector, reviewing it, and then um, considering it in the Australasian context, which is our, our our key challenge. But it's a very important piece of work that needs to be um, kicked off, um, and we 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 haven't done um, anything other than just review some of the literature at this stage. Great, thanks. Maybe I'll catch you offline about some options there. That'd be great. Yeah, happy to do that. Thanks. Greg, Greg thanks for the question. Uh, who's up next? Let me have a look here. Is there anyone else with a question? Thought I heard someone there. Adam, hi, it's Edward from yes, Canada. Yes, Edward. Yes, Edward. Um, so yeah, thanks very much. Um, it's fairly new to the environment in terms of learning about digital twin and smart cities. Um, I had a question in terms of the model that you had. When you said leading up to smart cities, you discussed bi-directional communication. Um, in terms of some of the models I've seen, they take the bi-directional communication back from the model, also to start essentially controlling or using actuators in the smart city. Was that considered as part of the digital twin or is that not included in the model you discussed? So Edward, uh, great question. Now what we're saying is that the digital twin um, can look at bi-directional data. Um, that's, you know, we, did, we had landed on a position about where we need to go, but the value that the digital twin provides is it can look at bi-directional data looking at it from the, you know, the capturing that physical, that the data from the physical, and then, you know, sending it back to the digital for analysis, for um, some machine learning to improve the operation in a digital sense before it's then transferred back to the real world environment to get a better outcome in um, the operational, the day-to-day -day operation sense. So we're not there yet. We've just acknowledged that there is that bi-directional opportunity that um, the digital twin um, can create uh, for the better operation of assets. But yeah, we haven't we haven't um, got a position on that yet. But a, a good piece of work will need to happen into the future about how that bi-directional uh, you know that, that information exchange can work. Um, safely in a, in a trusted environment um, and one which leads to better outcomes for the operation of the asset. Okay, great. No, thanks for the clarification, Andrew. Thanks for that uh, question, Edward. Uh, friends, other questions, comments? Comments. We've still got some time. Um, feel free to uh, pop something in the chat box or take yourself off mute and introduce yourself. Happy to take some more questions. Um, just while people are waiting, all those papers are available on our website. So um, please jump on and have a look. Um, you know, read read the the uh, papers we've got and the discussion paper, and provide comments back to us. We always welcome comments. Um, we recognise that you know, even though this has been written during 2020, released in January 21, that within a couple of years it could become out of date, and we'll need to review that again, just because. The environment is moving so quickly, particularly around uh, digital twins um, and, and uh, smart cities. Mm. Yep, excellent. Thank you. Um, Anand, yes. I'm going to ask a question. Sorry, I'd uh, just like to introduce myself. Anand, um, among other things, currently I also chair the Australia India uh, Business Council, the infrastructure chapter. Uh, we've been obviously talking to different entities on the smart cities. And because you mentioned about the smart city there, and you also mentioned about the, the role of digital twin, there is going to be an important factor of the integration between the digital twins representing different assets, the successful integration of this as uh, their digital twins is going to be quite critical if you're talking about bringing this together in a smart city context. Is there some work you've been doing or have you been, is your team been discussing with the industry or has there been some development in that, in that uh, space, which is quite which is something that would be 
keen to understand. So something, somebody we could approach and talk to people. And then we, we developed this, um, the, the position paper through 2020. Um, we'd identified that it's a policy gap in um, our you know, policy suite of documents, but we, we've only just sort of released it back in early January. Um, and we, and you know, we're looking for some discussion and conversation um, with people like yourself to um, you know, see whether you agree with what we've uh, put in the position paper and also what the next steps might be. So we haven't um, developed it um, you know, beyond what you see there, um, although we recognise there's going to have to be some next steps around development um, of this, particularly in relation to digital twins and smart cities, um, because that's going to be the, the key talking point through, in my view, through the 20s. You know, the roaring 20s are going to be embracing digital. They're going to be embracing what smart cities can deliver, not only for governments, but most importantly, for individuals, how they can improve their uh, life opportunities, their life outcomes, how they can get better information to make decisions to improve um, you know, their quality of life longer term. And that's where I see the digital twin and then smart cities intersecting and providing better outcomes uh, for everyday uh, residents. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank thanks. You. Thanks for that question, Anand. Um, friends, uh, still got five minutes to go, but I don't want to keep us longer than we have to. Uh, other other comments, questions for either Andrew or myself or anyone else that may be on the line that you feel might be able to answer a question. No. Okay, we might uh, we might wrap there. So let me just. Uh... Can I ask another one? Sorry. Oh because yes, no, I noticed, certainly. I noticed your position uh, with the cross city rail. Um, just was interested. Would you be actually be uh, introducing some of the dig digital twin aspects within that project because. So, the, so I'm the digital relationship manager in Cross River Rail. Yeah. One of the key things that we are looking at is the legacy that um, Cross River Rail can deliver for Brisbane um, and indeed South East Queensland. Um, and so one of those elements will be you know, how we use um, the digital uh, spine, as I'm calling it, um, which is the rail network itself, which will then link into other projects, uh, most notably public, but hopefully private projects as well, to then start to build that true digital twin of the Brisbane CBD, and then in time build that out um, across Brisbane. Um, and ultimately, you know, the, the utopia would be across um, uh, the whole of Queensland. But you know, by, we need to create the digital spine to start that digital journey. Um, and we also need to create opportunities for other projects to link into the digital spine um, in a framework that, that is both supportive um, and encouraging to the private sector so that it sees the value of participating in this digital world. Terrific, no, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Pleasure. So, um... So friends, I'm just going to do a final sweep here. Um, please put your hand up or come forward if you wanted to ask a final question. Okay, I'll, uh, I'll call time there just very quickly, a quick snapshot on some of the upcoming hub meet topics. Uh, again, head to the hub. Uh, to get the relevant registration links. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, very much looking forward to seeing you next month. Uh, and uh, Andrew, on behalf of our audience, thanks so much for sharing that great, uh, great work from ABUB with us today. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.